Good evening and welcome to Tracking the Tropics, your weekly in-depth look at the hurricane season. I'm CBS 17 Chief Meteorologist Wes Owenstein here in Raleigh, North Carolina, and we're now in week eight of the Atlantic hurricane se season and nearing August, a typical very busy month of hurricane season. And here's what we have coming up tonight on episode eight of Tracking the Tropics. Hi, I'm meteorologist Tara Lane in Charlotte, North Carolina. Since heavy rain and flooding are some of the biggest threats from a tropical system, it's important to talk about how to protect your home and its belongings. That's where flood insurance comes in. And tonight we'll discuss things like who needs it, when to get it, and exactly what's covered. Hello, I'm Chief Meteorologist Bob Jeswald in Columbus, Georgia. When we revisit our areas impacted by Alberto in 94 and Andrew in 92, the first named storms of the season and how devastating it was. We can never let our guard down. That's coming up. All right, good stuff tonight. And guess what? We've got some news. We've got some things to talk about here in the middle of July. If you missed it earlier today, tropical depression number seven formed way out in the central Atlantic. So it's no immediate threat to land and it may not impact the East Coast. Eventually the Caribbean, maybe the Gulf Coast, but we've got a lot of time to figure out where this is going to go. So just before five o'clock, the National Hurricane Center initiated advisories and the latest from the Hurricane Center winds are 35 miles per hour gust up to 45. Pressure is just above 1,000 millibars, and it's moving west-northwest at 8 miles an hour. And just to kind of get your bearing, I mean, there it is, way out in the middle of the Atlantic, still a long way away from the Caribbean and even farther away from the United States. So whatever happens, it's going to take a long time for it to reach significant land impact. Now remember, the last few weeks, there's been a lot of Saharan dust over the Atlantic. That's represented a lot of dry air, a lot of particulate matter in the atmosphere, and that's kind of held activity at bay until now. So we finally have got something forming out in the Atlantic. Everything up to this point has formed a little closer to home. The track of this depression, number seven, has it continuing to move west and increasing in intensity and possibly as early as later tonight or sometime tomorrow, it could strengthen and become our seventh named storm of the season. It would be Gonzalo and it would also be the earliest seventh named storm on record. Remember, we did that with Faye too, so this is not a trend we want to continue as it's shaping up to be a very busy season, which we expected. But when it's actually happening, you uh, think to yourself like, wow, this is really happening and it is. So it'll continue to move to the west. But remember, we've got a long time to figure out what's going to go on with this thing. It's probably going to run into some more dry air. So that's going to prohibit it from becoming a, a huge, massive storm. However, as we get into this weekend, that's when it's finally going to reach the Caribbean. And that's when we'll be able to make a better assessment of where it goes from there. Even if it does hold on and make it here this weekend as a tropical storm, it would be another several days into the middle or end of next week before it would reach mainland United States. So that's the latest on tropical depression number seven. Let's check out the computer model forecast. And what I want to show you concerning this is the consistency. Remember, when we look at the computer models or the spaghetti plots, as we often call them, we look at a couple things. We look at the trends. Where have the lines been and where are they shifting to? Again, each one of these lines represents a different computer model run. We also look at where the cluster is going. We don't get to pick our favorite line or pick the scariest line and worry about that. We look at the cluster and you can see a lot of them are clustered for several days out. That tells us there's a lot of forecast certainty with the computer models and that gives forecasters more certainty about telling you where this storm is going to get. But I want to get back to the Saharan dust because that made big news earlier this year when a huge plume of it made it all the way to the United States. It gave us some haze. It gave us some amazing sunsets and sunrises, and it also calmed down the tropics. Well, if you were with us last week, we showed you the forecast dust and how it would relax a little this week and we possibly could see some activity. Well, Unfortunately, that's exactly what's happened, but now what happens in the next seven days? So we pick it up from the current Saharan dust particulate matter, and you can see there's not a lot out there, which may have helped aid in the forming of this most recent system. But look, there's more coming off the coast of Africa. So as we go from tonight into the future, you can see looks like a little more Saharan dust will move across the Atlantic as we head into the next seven days. So we'll see if that holds things down in the coming week. And again, that could contribute to 
our current tropical depression not being able to really develop. But that's not the only thing out there. We've also got another system that is just in the eastern part of the Gulf of Mexico that the National Hurricane Center gives a 30% chance of developing in the next two days and a 40% chance of developing in the next five days. Right now, it's very disorganized. It's lopsided. All the thunderstorm activity is on one side of what could be a center. Despite all that, they are sending the Hurricane Hunter aircraft out there tomorrow if necessary, so we'll continue to keep an eye on that. But listen, it's a little different situation in the Gulf of Mexico because the water is so much warmer there this time of year. As we look at current ocean temperatures, anywhere you see those deep reds and almost getting to purple, I mean, you're well into the 80s, almost approaching 90 degrees. So it's a matter of time. You know, there's not a lot of room in the Gulf of Mexico for things to develop before it hits land. So will it get its act together soon enough before it reaches land and then has no threat of developing. Again, we'll keep an eye on this one. Nothing imminent and probably not enough time for anything huge to explode and develop. The computer models, not a lot of them have started to pick up on this system, but as you can see, they're in pretty good general consensus that this system could be headed for Texas, probably as just a rainmaker rain for Texas and Louisiana. Never a bad thing this time of year. It helps keep the heat down. So where are we? We've made it through phase six name storms. We mentioned Gonzalo would be the next one. That would be the depression out in the Atlantic. If the Gulf of Mexico system develops, it could possibly become Hannah. And this is one of the places we look in July for tropical activity to form. There's really four areas that we watch where over time, we've seen most of the systems develop. First one is in the Gulf of Mexico. I mentioned because of all the warm water and they usually move toward Texas or maybe up toward the Louisiana, Mississippi, Florida coast. The second place, and again, this has a lot to do with warm water, the Western Caribbean. And then a lot of times they'll sneak into the Gulf of Mexico and then affect the Gulf Coast. The third place we see a lot of activity form in July. This is also true for June is off the southeast coast of the United States in and around the Bahamas and those are the ones that usually flirt with the coast and then head out to sea. And then the fourth place, and this is new in July, July starts to see more activity form out in the central Atlantic, and that's exactly what we've seen with Tropical Depression 7. So as we kind of take a step back and look at where we are in the year, remember the season starts June 1st, it ends November 30th on the Atlantic side. This graph represents tropical activity. And as you can imagine, it creeps up as we head into the August and September months, the heart of summer when things really start to warm up in the tropics. It peaks on September 10th. But as where we are right now in this graph, we're still really in the beginning of the season. And I always like to compare the activity on the front side of the graph with the back side of the graph. So think of it. The third week in July, we get as much activity now as we do at the end of October, almost into November. So that gives you an idea of what's going on. As I said, we're a week and a half away from August starting, which typically is when the real hurricane season begins. But despite that, there is still time for you to do things to get you, your home and your family ready for a possible tropical system. And joining us now from Charlotte, North Carolina, is WJZY Chief Meteorologist Tara Lane, who has lived through many storms over the years in the Carolinas. And Tara, before you talk to us about the important things we can do to prepare for a hurricane, I've got to ask you about the other big weather story this week and the heat. I mean, are you guys infatuated and as tired of 90s as we are here in central North Carolina? Yeah, saying 90s over and over again is starting to get real old around here, certainly. And you know that, too, around the Raleigh area. So far in Charlotte, we've had about 26 days of 90-plus degree heat. And this latest stretch here, about 12 days in a row. And we're going to continue to add to that number in the coming days. And uh, on average, we get about 44 90-degree days. I think the longest stretch for the Charlotte area of 90-plus degree high temps in a row is 33. So we still have a ways to go on that. But uh, hopefully we don't catch up to that. <laughs> Back to uh, kind of the topic at hand, and that would be um, the tropics and getting ready. You know, we yes. always, um, you know, pound it into people's head. Let's be ready to go on June 1st. And you know, that's, that's hard to do when it comes down to it. But even though we're approaching August, there's still a lot we can do to get our homes ready and make sure we're prepared financially and physically if a storm were to come. Tell us a little bit about what we can do. 
Right, so we know all that heavy rain from landfalling tropical systems can produce totals in excess of six inches, leading to that flooding, not only along the streams, creeks, rivers, and roads, but in your home too. So now is the time, as we've been talking about, to prepare for that possibility that your home could one day be affected by this. So let's talk about flood insurance. Wes, do you think you need it? I mean, honestly, I don't have it and I don't think I need it at this point. But recently I talked to Robin Price. She's the president of a local insurance agency here in the area. And here's a few things she had to say when it comes to who might need it and what is covered. Well, we're all in a flood zone. So your insurance agent could tell you what type of zone you're in and whether it's a preferred zone or a higher risk zone. So that would be your first start, but everyone's in a flood zone and we all could possibly need flood insurance at some point in time. Well, the definition of flood insurance is rising water. So once the water starts rising, you, that is when flood insurance would come into play. Flood insurance would cover the dwelling and your contents coverage. Okay. So any contents coverage that you had in your basement would be covered if you had flood insurance. There's so many different variables to, it could, you know, when, depending how the water starts, it sometimes could be covered under your homeowner's policy. Mm -hmm. So when you get into the wind part, you know, that's where you start to think about hurricanes and yes. what, what's going on with hurricanes. Okay. So you would really need to check your policy to make sure you have that coverage. Okay, so there's flood insurance, there's homeowner's insurance, and then there's renter's insurance. So Wes, we'll elaborate a little more on each one for folks who are wondering. Yeah, and I guess most people probably assume they have it. Maybe they don't, but I would say most people have just the basic homeowner's insurance or renter's insurance. So your homeowner's and renter's insurance would not cover flood damage if you just have the basic, right? And that's right. It's the private homeowner's insurance policies. They typically do not cover the flood damage. However, now the wind from a hurricane damages your roof. If that happens and then rain gets in, some homeowner's policies do offer some protection if your policy includes that coverage for wind. And so that's why you would want to have that separate flood insurance. And as we mentioned off the top, you know, just because the season has already started, it doesn't mean that it's too late to take action. But there are some things that we need to think about. There are still deadlines if you want to change your policy, right? That's right, exactly. So the bottom line is, I mean, with an insurance agent, you have to meet with them. You should meet with them now and figure out what coverage you want and need. I mean, you've got the homeowner's insurance, the flood insurance, like we've been talking about, renter's insurance, which protects your belongings, and then landlord insurance, which uh, the landlord would obviously have that covers damage to the actual home or the structure. But you need to figure out what coverage you want and need for where you live. And the time to do it is now because I don't know if a lot of folks out there know this, once a storm is actually named, carriers will start restricting the binding coverage even inland, and then they won't write the coverage until the storm passes. So when the wind starts blowing, you just want to already have the coverage you need. Also, of course, remember if you're buying a new home, if you're in the, that position right now, make sure you have that homeowner's insurance in place way before you close on the house. Yeah, I guess uh, a way to compare it is you can't buy car insurance after you've already mm -hmm. been in an accident. It doesn't uh, doesn't work that way. Um, Tara, you've right. lived through a lot of hurricanes over the years in the Carolinas. Can you take us through some of the more memorable ones and the kinds of impacts that those storms brought to your area? Yeah, we were talking about this earlier. I started my um, career in meteorology, broadcast meteorology in eastern North Carolina. So I started and it was about oh, just a few months after I started. I uh, started on the air in April and in September, that's when Hurricane Floyd blew through. But of course, folks maybe that live in that part of the state, just before Floyd came through, Dennis 1 and 2 whipped through the eastern part of North Carolina, created that flooding, and of course, Floyd came through and just made that situation a lot worse. And so just a devastating situation for those folks in that part of the state. And it was a type of situation where we were all sleeping at the station. I mean, in the copy room with our pillows and blankets because uh, a lot of us couldn't get home to our house or apartment because the roads were just flooded out. And uh, just more recently here and during my time at Fox 46 Charlotte, it was a couple of years ago that we had uh, the impacts from Florence coming through. And then we had Michael. So Florence did a lot of, uh, 
flood damage, create a lot of flood damage, not only here in parts of the Charlotte area and upstate South Carolina, but as we know along the coast. And then Michael came through with a lot of wind damage later that season in October. Yeah, so many things to worry about with a hurricane. It's not just yeah. on the coast that impacts. You know, you guys in Charlotte are several hours inland, and you have just as many problems sometimes as our friends on the coast. Uh, Tara, good stuff. We appreciate you spending some time with us tonight. That's Tara Lane in Charlotte, North Carolina. All right, so let's uh, give a little bit of love to what's going on in the Pacific because their season has been going a little bit longer than the Atlantic side. Remember, their season starts earlier in May, and they have an active system as well. A new tropical storm over the last several days. And again, this is way out in the middle of the Pacific, just to kind of get your bearings. There's Hawaii and Honolulu on the far left part of your screen here. Let me step back in screen. And here's Mexico and the mainland United States. So this has been kind of cruising on to the west for a while. This one looks a little more impressive than the depression that just formed. And rightfully so, tropical storms are stronger. So let's take a look at tropical storm Douglas. So the track of this system will continue it more westerly than anything else and actually increase in its intensity, becoming the first hurricane of the Pacific or Atlantic season, expected either later tonight or sometime tomorrow, then strengthening to a Category 2 hurricane sometime Thursday or Friday. But it'll still be well away from Honolulu, and it actually could weaken to just a tropical storm before it interacts with the Hawaiian Islands. So just to kind of reset on the Pacific side, this is Douglas. They've already been through three named storms. Douglas, the fourth named storm on the Atlantic side. We could be getting ready for our seventh named storm. Not that it's a race, but that's what's going on on the Atlantic and the Pacific side right now. All right, let's get back to the Atlantic side. And as we get ready for possibly the G named storm later this week, and maybe even later tonight, the A name storm this year with Arthur. Do you remember that? It wasn't a memorable storm, but that's not always the case for A name storms. WRBL Chief Meteorologist Bob Jeswald in Columbus, Georgia, joins us now on Tracking the Tropics. Bob, you got a few A name storms that are memorable to share with us. But before we jump into that, yes. you guys are actually keeping a pretty close eye on what's going on with that system in the Gulf of Mexico. Y'all need some rain down there, right? Yeah, we can. You know, the summer months, Wes, is like, okay, bring it on. Even though we're close to about a foot, foot and a half in some areas above average year to date. But as you know, seasonal heat like we're going through right now, these mid upper 90s is making it uh, rather uncomfortable. And we can certainly use that extra rain. And when you go several days with mid 90s with nothing substantial in coverage, it, it's dry as a bone. So as you just point out, you got the East Pacific active. We're, we're possibly going into Gonzalo and likely will by Sunday. Um, I'm going to show you a different track that Wes just showed us. And you can see down here around Cuba, just a cluster of showers and storms. And this type of infrared imagery is showing you the very high cold cloud tops and they're discerned with the thunderstorms with those fancy orange colors. But this X marks the spot here in the Florida Straits. Sometime near the next day, we should be over the Keys, maybe a little circulation forming. But it's a very low chance, unlike what we were seeing farther out here on, of course, 7. So let's just take a look at Tropical Depression 7 again. Uh, as you can see, well over a 1,000 miles west-southwest of the Cabo Verde Islands. And uh, anyway, what's interesting about that, as Wes pointed out, is the Saharan dust phenomenon. It happens every year. It seemed to be more pronounced this year and has been absolutely helpful for minimizing or mitigating any of these storms developing earlier in the season. But here we are looking at that for the latest. So where are we? Gonzalo is up next on the hit list and we're talking about Arthur first we had Ber Bertha everyone may remember Cristobal Dolly Edward Faye and then we could be getting into our next uh, round here Wes and when that happens you know it is certainly getting close to that time where it's becoming active busier mm -hmm. and as you pointed out a very warm Gulf of Mexico yeah August is right around the corner August starts with a let's talk about some a name mm -hmm. storms you've got proof that you cannot have your guard down just because it's the first name storm of the season and starting with one that hit you guys hard back in 1994. 
Exactly. El, it was Alberto. And who wants to see that in your first one? But here's something interesting. It wasn't even a hurricane at all. Here's some video we're showing you right now when it came on shore. This is around Destin, Florida, when it made landfall right around the 4th of July holiday. If anyone remembers that in 94, it was just horrible. Now, it was up to about 65, almost just a weak hurricane, but it never made it that way. But when it came inland, the dams opened up. The rivers were inundated from Alberto. And you could see what happened here. Everybody he had to use boats for rescuing central Georgia, the Flint River, even in parts of east central Alabama, west central Georgia, and even Americus got hit so hard in our viewing area. We've seen this many times, most recently with Michael, and uh, of course, uh, Hurricane Michael brought parts of our southeast part of our community in disarray. So we looked at that track of tropical storm Alberto. It was a depression when it moved inland. And as you saw Tara talk about flooding, inland flooding, what a mess it was because it stalled out and it did this little dually doop here. Take a look at this. As it comes through Auburn, Alabama, that was the center of circulation as a depression. But where Americus is, the area shaded in green, that's where we had 20 plus inches of rain. Could you imagine that in just a couple day period? It was so bad for the rivers backing up and everything started to overflow. Every tributary and creek was just filling into these rivers and made for just a mess. So trek in the tropics, of course, you could see with Alberta was a depression over Georgia. It did not have to be a hurricane to be this devastating. More than a billion dollars in damage. Here's uh, the NOAA rendition back here in 1994 where it showed some of the rivers and tributaries that were greatly impacted for when it came on shore in the western panhandle, in southern Alabama, the southeast part here, and in our viewing area. And everything on the right side of that eye wall brought in major flooding here. You could even see across this whole entire area how menacing this was. Wes, I'll tell you something. This is something that we don't want to see again when they're slow moving mm -hmm. and they just sit and spin. You know, you guys know more than I know, of course, in North Carolina, what can happen. Yeah, so Alberto, a tropical storm. A few weeks ago on Track in the Tropics, Bob, we talked about Allison, just a tropical storm. There's no right. such thing as just a tropical storm, but from Alberto, let's go to Andrew in 92. A totally different storm, but so much more devastating for so many more people across the Gulf Coast. Oh, you're not kidding. Let's go right into that. You could see from when we go from back to uh, Alberto to two years earlier, let's go to 1992 in August. Check this out. Of course, it was infrastructure. It was part of the whole portion of Homestead, Florida that was not prepared. I was working, ironically, here in Columbus, Georgia at that time. And although we didn't have a direct impact, it was the story of the century before, of course, the 1900 Houston one in the 35 uh, years. But we'll talk more about that in a minute. But you can see the impact it had on infrastructure just around town. Roofs ripped off, uh, the heavier rain. And you could see more of this coming up in just a bit. You could see see the devastation uh, days afterwards when we realized that just about every portion of South Florida was completely annihilated from this Category 5 major hurricane that we hadn't seen. And it was the first named storm. Never let your guard down. Here it was August and we were talking about Andrew in 1992 and that was the end result. So how does it shape up when you start to look at hurricanes? Let's not get into the category and the, the of course the strength of the winds. It's the surge. It's much more than that. But combined as this water piles up when you have this kind of force coming in across the water. A category two, 96 to 110 mile per hour winds, which is extensive damage. But could you imagine South Florida where homes were not designed properly to withstand this kind of surge, nor the consistent wind? This is only a cat three. This is what a cat four looks like. Now let's get into a cat five. What we're looking at on the high end, what we're looking at for Andrew when it came in, constant winds, catastrophic damage damage and it continued like this and we hadn't seen anything like this from the Bahamas or South Florida until of course 25 years later Irma we all remember that in 2017 which actually impacted us with a tropical depression here with some power outages but again Andrew was just devastating catastrophic and you can see it's always on that quadrant that right side wall that comes in that was devastating and that actually impacted of course that direction as it came in all portions of South Florida the front right maximum the front left a significant storm surge with the water so every side of a hurricane you cannot 
take with a grain of salt. There's some impact somewhere or another. And even with the passage of a storm, the surge even after it lands makes landfall will still make a significant impact when it comes to inland flooding again. So we saw Alberto and now let's talk about Andrew as it came through the Bahamas, South Florida, arced its way through Mississippi. And guess what? There you have it. You know it. <laughs> it came right up in your neck of the woods right there, mm -hmm. Wes, right in Raleigh, North Carolina. Yeah, and Andrew held records and was the storm of record for so many years. That's the only storm people remembered being really bad. Of course, that all changed recently. Um, can you kind of give us some context? You mentioned it a little, but where does Andrew stand in the whole big scheme of things, especially considering all the activity we've seen the last few years? Exactly. You know, I mentioned Irma, and Irma, of course, was amazingly catastrophic. The size of it was just unprecedented, and, and, and it, it really obviously devastated the Bahamas. But as it came through the Bahamas and it hit Florida, it wasn't the Cat 5. But the Cat 5s we're looking at, and you rank it, Andrew was right there number three, and you could see the Labor Day was 1935, the strongest by far and the most deadliest. And by today's standard with infrastructure, would have been the most costliest. Of course, we know Katrina, but Katrina wasn't a landfall Cat 5. Many people forget about how it sheared before it came on shore and passed Christian, Mississippi, and then came into Louisiana and that western side of it and breached the levees, which caused all the flooding. But Camille in 69 was another one, obviously, for Louisiana. That's the one a lot of people remember was a direct impact. And then there comes Andrew in 92. Irma, of course, 25 years later, but didn't make it as a Cat 5 on the U.S. soil. And in Michael in 2018, which impacted us, west here again. I showed you what happened with Alberto in 94 with 27-plus inches of rain. America's Georgia got hit again from Michael in 2018 in our viewing area. And when it came inland, again, a lot of damage, but nothing like we saw with Alberto. But it was amazing as it came in as a major hurricane this far inland. And it doesn't happen quite often, but we can never let our guard down on those first name storms as yep. we've been talking about. And that list, the only four Cat 5 hurricanes to ever make landfall in the United States. Bob, we appreciate it. Thanks for spending some time with us tonight. That's Bob Jeswald Absolutely. down in Columbus, Georgia. And a little food for thought here, and not to sound like an old man yelling at kids to get off his yard, but remember those storms, Tropical Storm Alberto, the A storm, the first name storm in July, Andrew back in 92, that hit in August, July and August. It's July in 2020, and we're getting ready for the seventh name storm, the G storm, not the first. So things have definitely changed. And we are out of time tonight. Thank you for joining us on tonight's Tracking the Tropics. Remember, we're here every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern every week during the Atlantic hurricane season. And we appreciate you spending part of your night with us live in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm Wes Owenstein. Take care.